Father, speaking of letting us know that, or let, letting others know that they're loved, you want to do that today. So speak, speak your love to our hearts as only you would know how. Through a thousand distractions, speak love. In the name of Jesus, amen. 20 million Americans, and maybe you're one of them, 20 million Americans have been tested. Unfortunately, every one of your minds thought the same thing. No, not that tested. COVID has trained us to think of one test. We're talking about a different test. 20 million Americans have tested through the tests provided by Ancestry.com, the Utah-based company, and 23andMe out from California. 20 million Americans have gotten their DNA tested to find out a little bit more of their story, a little bit more of their background. Dr. Fomen, Westchester uh, a professor of media and communication, who has studied DNA testing for 13, 14 years now, uh, spoke up recently and just said, hey, if you're going to get DNA tested, if you're going to do the DNA testing, just have a very frank conversation with your family before. Because once you're tested, there may be some things that you have to talk about that you really wanted to know before you were tested. Case in point, three stories. Alice Collins decided to do the DNA test. She did it all in good fun. She identified herself as an Irish American, but was shocked to find a mix of European Jewish, Middle Eastern, and Eastern European genes in her results. So she gets her whole family on this family-wide DNA testing. She learns that her father, through this family-wide DNA testing, all comes out, wait a minute, He's not the biological son of her grandparents. His parents, the people that he has now lived 80-some years as their son, finds out at the bottom of the story, must have been sent home with the wrong family. Conversation. Lydia Fairchild through DNA testing, this is crazy, through DNA testing discovers that she was not the mother of the children she had given birth to. Now, she was in the delivery room. She knows where those kids came from. But the DNA testing says, nope, you're not the mother. You're most likely the aunt. So what happens? Well, scientists put their heads together. There's no plot. But what they do discover is that they conclude that as a, a inf uh, not as an infant, in her mother's womb, she must have had a twin whom sh she absorbed their DNA. And now her children bear the DNA of the twin she absorbed in the womb. Who would have known? Yeah. Then comes Anna Marie with her story. She's a 50-year-old Delaware woman who took a DNA test. She was a bit confused, though. Her dad, being Russian, she looked for the results on her test. Her brother took the test. Sure enough, 31% Russian. But it didn't show up at all for Anna Marie. She's looking at it, looking at her brothers, going, what, what, what happened here? Then a short time later, she's contacted by an individual she didn't know who said, I think, I think we're related. How so? I think we're cousins. You should know my uncle Cecil. No, I don't know your uncle Cecil. And then this, this, this new cousin of Anna Marie says, well, could you ask your mom? And just see if she's ever heard of Cecil. Well, Anna Marie asked her mom, have you ever heard of Cecil? Oh, mama plays it off for a little while, but then she starts to say, look, mom, look, this DNA testing, I'm, 
And finally, mom remembers a Cecil. Yes, when I was 17 or 18, there was a lifeguard, the Ocean City, Maryland. We had a little summer fling. Well, mom, that summer fling, it's a little bit more for me, now 50 years of age, to find out my father. As Dr. Foman says, if you're going to do the DNA testing, have an honest conversation with your family before you do. Because in a moment, what you were sure of, I am sure of where I come from, I am sure of who I am, can change. What we are certain about becomes uncertain. Hold that in your mind. We'll get right back to that. Got your Bibles? Our theme, our theme text, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 20, is Jehoshaphat's cry to Israel and to Judah. Hear me, O Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Hear me. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. And then he pushes it further. Believe his prophets and you will prosper. What's Jehoshaphat getting here? Well, it's an understanding of what the prophets were. See, we've, we have often, and not altogether mistakenly, but we have often reg- relegated the prophets to speak about worldwide events or world-ruling empires, and they do. But the majority of the prophets' work is to communicate the heart the pathos, as Abraham Hetchel in his magnum opus work, The Prophets, he coins this phrase, the pathos of God. What is he talking about? The intimate, the heart, burning passion that God has for us. That's the work of the prophets. And so we have lost some of their work when we have just pointed at statues and beasts. What Jehoshaphat cries for is embrace the work of the prophets, their writings, their words, because they are, they are the communicators that God is using to show you his heart. Hear, hear, believe the prophets and you will prosper. That's a relationship language. That's you, God says, I want to bless you and prosper you. Everybody knows good relationships. You're a healthier person. I magnify that now. Just extrapolate that into the context of, of God. And now you've got this relationship with God. What it was meant to be, how much more of a person, of a being you will be. Through the Ages, God's prophets shared the heart of God. That's why A.W. Tozer speaks up, and I shared this line last week, but let me just grab it again. We take things at second hand. Now, I don't mind second hand when Melanie says, hey, going shopping, doing a little second hand shopping, going to Goodwill. I say, have a party. Better you than me for sure, but uh, have a party. But secondhand relationships are not what we were intended for. And a secondhand relationship with God was not what we were intent, what we were created for. We were created for that relationship. And so A.W. Tozer says, that's the work of the prophets. They, we've taken things secondhand. We've never had a true encounter with God, and we cannot relate our religion to our lives. But God wants to break through that secondhand and give us a firsthand. He wants to take us to a new level. And that word that A.W. Tozer uses, we need a true encounter. I'll just, I'll just tell you what I do at the top of every one, as I write the sermon Thursdays, sit in a little cubicle in the Johnstown Library. I write it out. I, I, I walk in with literally my backpack and a duffel bag full of books. I, I just move my library there, set up shop for the day. At the top of, of my notes, I write what what preachers call the big idea or the single simple sentence. What's the big idea? What is the one thing that we want to take away? Today, it's right at the top of my notes. I want to extend an invitation for you to have a firsthand personal encounter with Jesus. That's it. 
If you were up late last night or up early, you can now doze off. You got it. I, I was writing last week when uh, Teresa Johansson, right here from the church office, sends me a text and says, hey, this is just a powerful line. I read it this morning. And then she was right. It was a powerful line. It was one of Max Lucado's books titled, You Were Made for This. But let me put his words on the screen. The, the words that she, she texted me Thursday morning. Do we know him before whom we gather? <laughs> well, we were in God's house. But do we know him before whom we gather? Do we understand that demons fear and flee at the sound of his name? That angels have been singing holy, holy, holy since before creation and still haven't sung it enough? That a glimpse of God's glory caused Isaiah the prophet to beg for grace and Moses the patriarch to duck under the protection of a rock? Do we know before whom we gather? Do we comprehend his grandeur, his glory, his fire and power? If we did, Lucado says, we'd likely enter the sanctuary, the house of God, wearing helmets and body armor. Could it be that we are suffering from a loss of awe? And if we are, what are the consequences? And then he finishes. Here's what I think. A wimpy God makes for a wimpy heart. That's his language for a secondhand God. That's, if he was A.W. Tozer, that's what he would say. But a great God, firsthand, relationship, a great God makes for a solid saint. And then this line that captured my mind all week, let him be big. I tweeted it out. I just said, that's it. Let God be big. And a secondhand God is wimpy, small, it makes for a wimpy Christian. The invitation then is to have a first-hand encounter relationship with Jesus. We're going through the prophets, mostly the non-written prophets, the ones that we don't, didn't write their books. Jeremiah wrote, most likely wrote Kings, stories of Elijah and Elisha. This week we're talking about Elisha, the successor to Elijah who prayed the prayer, God, if you want to give me one thing, I'm asking for a double portion of the spirit that rested on Elijah. It's interesting to note that the, the stories and miracles attributed to Elisha, there's 28 of them exactly, are twice as many. 14 were, were given to Elijah. Twice as many miracles as Elijah, Elisha had. And if you're going to talk about miracles, if you're going uh, to kind of line up the miracles not that I, I don't even know that you can really say that there's miraculous miracles because they're all miracles. But Elisha's miracles really are kind of the first round picks of miracles. I mean, they're, they're miraculous miracles. They're, they're, they're just so creative, just kind of above the cut. The, the boys or the youth making fun, and then there's these bears that come out, and there's an axe head that floats, and then there's a widow that, that needs oil, and she has to gather all of these uh, pots and containers to as many as she can gather. And, and then there's the promise of a son, and then there's a resurrection of a son, and then there's the bitter stew that is going to kill him, and, and Elisha makes it safe with the marriage. There's the feeding of a hundred men through just a few loaves. You know where that points forward to. Na Naaman's leprosy and the, and the dirty Jordan River dunking seven times. What about the Syrians surrounded Dothan and then were blinded and led into the capital city, Samaria? What about, what about the, the Syrians that, these Syrians were always coming back. What about the, the, the siege that they laid? And Elisha said, no, there's going to be a change. You just watch. And lepers find this loot strewn over miles of retreat as the Syrians hear the sound of an invisible army. You got to admit, when it comes to miracles, these are kind of the, the miracles of the miracles in the Old Testament. Two stories, though, from Elisha's life. He left us a legacy, an invitation to you and to me, and I think two stories best 
illustrate that. Story number one. Elisha is in Dothan with his servant. Servant gets up early. There's Aram, king of Syria, who had been, who had been meeting in, his, in some private meetings with his leaders and making some plans to just kind of pick on the king of Israel. But every time he made a plan, he said, all right, we're going to go there. We're going to lay in wait. When, he, when they pass, we're going to, okay, we're going to capture and we're going to, and then they would never pass by. And, and pretty soon it became clear that this was not coincidence. And so uh, Aram started pointing his fingers at, at those in his circle going, ah, is it you? where were you yesterday at three o'clock? Where, come on, guys. And one of them says, yeah, it's none of us. There's a prophet over in Israel that knows what's happening even in your bedchambers. Aaron didn't like that so much. Say, all right, well, uh, let's go get this prophet then. Let's go get the prophet. I just like to pause and just, just reflect on that. Just to know that God knows the very secrets of my heart and still loves me is good news. And it's also good news that God knows the secrets of the world. I don't have to, 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 to be a spy for conspiracy, for, for stuff that's coming down, for stuff that's falling up. God's already been in those council rooms, in those chambers. That he's still God there as much as he is in the open. I, I think I've, he needs, like me, to be his investigator to, to really tell him what people are doing and what organizations are, and, and to fix. And he says, oh, I've been there. I've got it. Well, so then Aram sends his, his mighty force. Let's pick up the story. You got your Bibles? Of course you do. Second, there's Bibles in the pew back in front of you. You missed bringing yours. We're in 2 Kings chapter 6. All right. 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 14. Then he sent horses and chariots, and a strong force. He sends a strong force. This is intentional. This little village in north of Samaria of Dothan is, doesn't need a strong force. But Aram, is, is, he's not taking any chances. He's going to make a grand statement. So he surrounds the city with this grand force. And they went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God, that is Elisha, got up and went out early the next morning. All right, this is, this, this is a good lesson, right? We get to rise early to go out, go for a run, get some exercise. He's headed out, doing his stretches, getting ready to, to do his uh, training run, of course. It, wait a minute. This doesn't look good. There's this whole, whole circle of Syrian soldiers, a mighty force surrounding the city, the little village of Dothan. And so listen to, us, listen to the servant. It's the exact same thing that every one of us would say if we walked out on our, our front porch and saw the Syrians. Oh, my Lord, what should we do? What do you do? His point, there is nothing to do. We are doomed. And then verse 17. Or verse 16. Don't be afraid, Elisha says. Don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And comes those famous lines that have echoed through the ages. And then Elisha prays for his servant. He says, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Do you, did you just catch that last line? What are they around? What? We assume they're around Dothan. They're around Elisha. There's, there's a hint. There's something going on. Jeremiah says, whoa, wait a minute. I need you to know who they were surrounding. Because this, is, this isn't just a, a, a political exchange between the Syrians and heaven. This is a personal relationship. You're going after one of ours. Who were they around? They were around Elisha. 
Oh, wow. Maybe arguably, we would say, the most powerful, the most amazing of all the stories, the most overwhelming. Here are the Syrians surrounding Dothan. And then Elisha prays, God, open his eyes, please. And it wasn't the eyes, his physical eyes. The story is clear that he saw what was there. But there was an ultra reality, a invisible reality. The opening of his eyes, which Elijah prayed for, were those eyes of his, not of his body, but of his spirit, of his faith. Faith sees the reality of divine presence and the protection which, where, all, where all is vacancy and darkness to the ordinary eye. Faith lays hold upon something deeper. The fiery nature of these chariots denotes that they were of supernatural origin and only the eye of faith could see them. wow, God, Lord, what do we do? Seems the cry of, of our lives from one month to the next. What do I do about this, God? Why this and then next? And, and Elisha taps us on the shoulder and says, don't be afraid. See what you can see through the eyes of faith. If you only could see, you would see fiery chariots. We want the big God. Let God be big, says Max Lucado. Elisha, we've got a big God. But how was it possible? Why was it that Elisha saw it? The invisible. And here's where the second story, I believe, I will argue before you today that, that second, this second story, which in it, in turn, is actually the first story. This first story, this moment in Elisha's life set him up for the possibility of the double portion of the Spirit, for these miracles of miracles, for this moment to see the invisible. One moment made it all possible. What moment am I talking about? It's back in 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Who was Elisha? Well, he's the son of a wealthy farmer. Family was faithful to God. They were known in their region to be faithful to God. They were in a region of Israel called, uh, uh, called Abel Meholan, Mehola, rather. It was, it's entitled Dancing, it's translated Dancing Meadows. It's the kind of the breadbasket, the northern kingdom. It was a very productive place and the farmlands. And, and here Elisha's family was wealthy in that area. We, we know they were wealthy because most farmers had one set of oxen. Elisha's family had 12 sets of oxen. So 12 times, if middle class was one set of oxen, they were 12 times that of middle class. They were known to be wealthy. One afternoon, Elisha is supervising in the field. The Bible says he was driving the 12th pair, kind of the supervisor out on the field. And here comes Elijah lays a mantle on him. That mantle had become famous, by the way. Ahab could recognize Elijah by the description. And then Elijah keeps going. Listen to the exchange. First Kings chapter 19 and verse 19. <clears throat> so Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with the 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was dri driving the 12th pair. He was leading the team. Elijah went up to him, threw his cloak on him, and then apparently kept walking. That's it. No exchange, no conversation. He threw his cloak on him, but Elisha knew what the invitation was. He knew what it meant. So Elisha, verse 12. 20, left his oxen, ran after Elijah. He said, let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye. I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm willing to commit. In that moment, he had decided he would commit, and then I will come with you. Elijah said, go back. What have I to do with you? Of course. Of course. So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burnt the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. He made a public decision. I'm all in. In an instant, he had no warning. He was faithfully doing what he believed God had called him to do. And then God showed up through the prophet Elijah and said, now I'm calling you. I'm calling you. Today is your day. 
What are you going to do? In an instant, Elisha made a commitment. It's interesting. You read this story in, in 1 Kings 19. Scholars have noticed a strange familiarity with what 1 Kings 19 describes with Elijah and Elisha and what Mark describes in chapter 10 with a ruler and Jesus. All right? Recap the story here of Elisha. Elijah comes walking by, has one quick interaction, wordless interaction as we understand it, and, and on Elisha's heart comes the appeal. He's been faithful in all that he knew to do, but now in an instant, he knew God's call for him to go deeper and further. Now let's go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 is this account of the young ruler. Starting in verse 17, it says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him. The same expression. Elisha had to run after Elijah. What Mark describes here, there must have been some sort of quick moment where maybe Jesus passed by the, the ruler's place of business. Maybe he passed by his company, his office, and, and made eye contact. Jesus was intentional, as we know, through all the other stories to be intentional on where he went. This day, as Jesus was walking, he was intentional on where he was going. He walked right by, appealing to this man's heart. I don't know, maybe there was a, 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 a where the eyes met, and the young ruler saw Jesus and knew, hey, wait a minute, he's calling for me to do something. Something Something happened where the young ruler's heart was stirred and he knew that he was being called to a greater, a deeper commitment. And he ran after Jesus. The fact that he ran after Jesus, we know Jesus passed by, just like Elijah to Elisha. This man, we find out, this young ruler was wealthy. So was Elisha. This young ruler had been faithful in all that he knew to do, just like Elisha. In fact, the, the, the young ruler tells Jesus, I have done all of that from my youth. I have been faithful in all I've known to do. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit life? Jumping down to verse 21, Jesus looked at him. And loved him. One thing you lack. Do you hear that line? Loved him. This is a relationship question. This is not a fulfillment of expectations. This is not our work with a, with a government organization where I have to obey certain things and then I am. No, no, no. This is a relationship. He loved him. One thing you lack. He said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. By the way, Jesus is not averse to having us have treasure. He promises the man treasure in heaven. He promises it for eternity. It's not that he's averse to treasure, but he's calling for a, a deeper, more dramatic, more intimate relationship. He says, get rid of it. Sell it. Give it to the poor. Come follow me. And in that moment, in the instant, this young ruler had the same question Elisha did. Am I going to go deeper? Am I going to go deeper with Jesus? What happened in 1 Kings chapter 19 did not happen in Mark chapter 10. At this, the man's face he went away. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Elisha becomes the counter to the rich young ruler. Their stories parallel each other, and tell you it comes to the point where one makes the decision. He takes the oxen. His leadership role, that 12th pair of oxen that set him aside as the leader of the company. His future was secure financially in that business. And he sacrificed them, even burning the equipment he used to plow with. It was all on the altar for Jesus. That moment changed forever Elisha's destiny. The alternative is the young ruler in Mark. There's an operative line in verse 21. 
1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 21. This operative line is at the very end of the verse. Then he set out to follow Elijah and to become his servant. Don't miss that. Just moments ago, he was the boss. He was the one that told everyone else to do what to do. And in an instant, God calling him to a sacrificial place of being a servant. The Bible actually lines it out later that he poured the water for Elijah. He poured the water for the hands of Elijah. This was a servant's role. He wasn't promoted to lead prophet. This was a call to be faithful in some small things. You've heard that theme repeated several times today. This was the invitation of God to put everything on the altar. And in that, there are times that God will call us to be faithful as nothing more than servants. But I'm used to, but God, you've given, Elijah could have protested, God has given me gifts to be a leader. Yes, but in this instant, for your commitment, for your journey, God is calling you to be a servant. Two things happened in that moment. Elisha's life was changed. He gave up certainty for uncertainty. He was no longer the one in charge. He gave up the promising company, a secure financial future, to become the servant of the prophet. We have made comfort and certainty our God. Whatever I am comfortable with is what now dictates my life. If I'm not comfortable with it, I don't do it. If it's not safe, secure for me in the sense of, of, of convenience or comfort, I'm averse to it. We use language like comfort zone. In that moment, Elisha gave up what was certain for him and became uncertain. But in that moment as well, Elisha's uncertainty, he gave up uncertainty for certainty. What he wanted, the questions that he would have to decide, he now surrendered them to a master. He would now be the servant. He would take orders from someone else. And that gave him a level of certainty. You've got to know that when he told Naaman, go wash in the Jordan seven times, he knew how incredibly foolish that sounded. But he was the servant to a master. And so he said to Naaman, as sure as you're standing there, Naaman, this is the only way it's going to work. Naaman must, he must have seen the confusion on Naaman's face. The, the questions that, wait, wait, say that one more, go, just go over the plan one more time with me. And Elisha knew in that moment, he had the certainty, he was not being called to decide whether this made sense or not. He was serving a master. His uncertainty gave him certainty. So when he gave up his certainty to accept the uncertainty of serving, that uncertainty in turn became certainty. I know it doesn't make sense in the English language. I, I, I know. And that's been our protest. God, that doesn't make sense how you would lead me that way. Take me down that path or take this away from me or give this to me. It doesn't make sense, God. And we sound a, more, a lot more like Naaman than we do like Elisha. Because Naaman was used to calling the shots from how he saw. No, no, no. Of course I wouldn't do that in the Jordan River. It's dirty. I can go back to Syria and, and, and have a, a much more, it's, it's much cleaner there. See, when you're, when you're the boss, that's the decisions you make. But when you become the servant... When you enter into that servant relationship, when you sacrifice the oxen and their tools on the altar, then your uncertainty becomes certain in the fact that the master said, do this. It doesn't have to make sense. Elisha gave up certainty and accepted uncertainty, and that uncertainty produced the greatest certainty of all. Wow. 
Wouldn't you know that at the end of his life, Elisha, at the end of his life, he wasn't granted a chariot ride like he had seen Elijah go. But he finished his life on a bed of suffering from illness. It was not given to Elisha to follow his master in a fiery chariot. But on his bed of illness, Joash, the rebellious king, shows up. This is the whole time you remember to shoot the arrow and then bang the arrows on the ground. And that's how much, how, how much, time, how much God is going to give you victory. It was that moment when Joash entered into the room and sees the prophet now suffering on his deathbed, the king says the same thing Elisha did when he saw Elijah go, my my father, my father, Israel's chariots and horsemen. And you've got to know that in that moment, Elisha remembered standing there on the east side of the Jordan River, watching Elijah being swept up in the very presence of God. But where is he? On a bed of suffering day after day and month after month. He didn't follow Elijah in the chariot. Upon him, the Lord granted. I'm just reading a couple of lines here from the volume Prophets and Kings. To him, it was granted. Upon him, the Lord permitted, rather, to come a lingering illness. During the long hours of human weakness and suffering, his faith had to lay hold of the promise of God and he beheld ever about him heavenly messengers of comfort and peace. As he saw them on the heights of Dothan, so he saw them encircling his bed, the fiery chariots of of Israel and the horsemen thereof. He was conscious of their presence, of the sympathizing angels that now sustained him. He proved faithful to the end. Never had he wavered. Never had he lost his trust in the power of omnipotence. Always, when the way before him seemed utterly closed, he had still advanced by faith and held on to the God he knew from the first day. When on alongside the road, Elijah said to him, God's calling you to go deeper. Are you willing to give up your certainty for uncertainty, which will produce the greatest certainty? Are you willing? And unlike the rich young ruler, Elisha goes back and in an act of faith offers that 12th pair of oxen, his leadership role, his financial security, he offers it on the altar. And his testimony while he lays on his deathbed of suffering was that he beheld, just like he beheld in Dothan, he beheld the angels still circling him. Do you remember where, where Jeremiah tells, you, tells us the, 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 the chariots of fire were circling? Were they circling Dothan? Nope, 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 nope. It doesn't say they circled Dothan. It says they encircled Elisha. That's the reward of a man or a woman who is willing to lay all on the altar and to go deeper than ever before. The Bible doesn't tell us how it ended for the rich young ruler, but eventually he became the old rich ruler. And at some point, he must have been laying on his deathbed. What fired across his mind as he lay on his deathbed? We don't know. We're not told, but I have a hunch As he lay there, that old rich ruler laid back and could remember that moment, the one moment in which Jesus extended to him an eternal decision, follow me. Those words must have echoed in his mind until the day he died. But for Elisha, who also heard the invitation through the prophet Elijah, but it's from the same Jesus. I want to go deeper with you. You've been faithful all of your life, but now I want to invite you to go deeper. And Elisha says, 
Here am I, Lord. Here am I. Second Kings, the final story of Elisha. That's the best story of all. Second Kings chapter 13. They're taking a, there's a little funeral procession that's going out of the city and they come up over a rise and there's a, 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 a squad of Moabite raiders. They're coming to raid and, and, and this group knew what that meant. This funeral procession knew that they would come and take everything they could from them. They would strip them, rob them, and even steal some of their young. And so the, they took the, the man that they were about to bury and they threw him in the nearest tomb, which happened to be Elisha's. And then they scattered to, to escape from the Moabite raiders. Well, that man tumbled into the, the man, the body, tumbled into the, the tomb of Elisha. And 2 Kings chapter 13 tells us when hit, this corpse touched the bones, he's already disintegrated. There's nothing but the bones left. When he touched the bones of Elisha, he got up and went running out of the tomb, joined, his, joined the funeral procession as they ran across and scattered over the landscape. It leads the Andrews Bible commentary of the Old Testament to include this line at the end of that story. Give attention to the dead prophets because their words, God's words, still bring life. The bones of Elisha resurrect a man. The words of Elisha, his life and his testimony will still bring life. Expose yourself to them. I invite you. We've only got four weeks now. It started with seven weeks. Now it's four weeks. Four weeks. I invite you to expose yourself to the life and words of the prophets. Take, take, cut out the doom scrolling, the, the, uh, the gossiping, the, the media, the entertainment. Do something that allows your, t- your life to have time to expose itself to touch the bones, the words of the dead prophets, and you will find life. Got one more story for you, and we're done. Speaking of DNA testing, let me put the pictures on the screen. 74-year-old Walter and 72-year-old Alan. They grew up together, born in Honolulu, lived in the same part of the community, they had been friends for 60 years. They met in elementary school. And from elementary school, they, become, they became best of friends for the rest of their lives. They did everything together. They played high school football together. They even say, jokingly, that they were so tight they could have married the same woman. They didn't. But they were so tight. They did everything together. And after their families, after they had children, they took family vacations together. They were Tight as friends. Well, Walter, just a few years ago, just takes this DNA test. Ah, it's fascinating. Of course, he's going to tell his best friend about it. Hey, man, you've got to check this out. Take this test. It tells you all sorts of crazy stuff. You just learn about yourself. So Alan then takes the test. They find out. 99% likelihood that they are not just best friends. They are brothers from the same two parents. Well, they said they had to forgive their mom as a story is born out after Pearl Harbor was attacked. Things went very crazy and she had to get rid of her boys, get them to safe places. And she had to separate them and put them in others' homes. And they never knew. She died before she could ever tell them. For 60 years, they'd been friends, best friends. But one day they found out they were meant to be more than friends. They were meant to be brothers. Some of us for 60 years, for 20 years, for two years, have been good friends with God. Of course, I'll go every week. My tithe, yes. Sabbath, of course. I'll go out this afternoon and even share a little bit of God's love to others. We're good friends. 
We're even the best of friends. And you lived with a relationship that was meant to be deeper. Tozer would call it a second-hand relationship. When you were meant to be related and you have stopped at just being friends. And in a moment, Elijah walking along the road taps Elisha on the shoulder. In a moment, Jesus walking along the road taps that young ruler on the shoulder and says, you've done it. You've been faithful. All of your life, you've been faithful. But in this moment, I'm calling you to go deeper. Are you willing to take this step? And one of them on his deathbed had to face the reality that he lived his life without going that next step. He probably lived the rest of his life being faithful to the commandments that he knew but being unfaithful to the call to a radical, deeper, more intimate relationship with Jesus. Elisha, though, on his deathbed, while still suffering, he didn't get scooped up by a... No, the chariots didn't come for him. But on his deathbed, he saw angels and chariots of fire. What made the difference? One moment made the difference. I can't help but think that Jesus would walk by today and say, do you know, do you know who you've been worshiping? Am I really a big God to you? Or have we been in the friend zone and we were made for much more? I want to be related to you. I want you to be my brother. I want you to be a son and a daughter of the kingdom. I want you to go deep. I want us to be blood related. So what's it going to be, beloved? You're going to hold out? No, no, I've been faithful. God, we're good. This friend thing is working for me. That's close enough, God. Are you afraid of what you're going to give up? The certainty for the uncertainty of being a servant of the master? This, I can tell you from the story of Elisha, that that uncertainty will grow to be the greatest certainty of eternity. Come on now. I'd like to welcome you if you're just visiting today. We have a connect card. That's a card right in the pew back in front of you. Our worship team is going to be coming up and joining me here. It's a connect card that just says you were visiting today. If you put your information there and just says I was visiting, we're gonna, we'll send you a gift in the mail. You say, I don't do pencils and pens anymore. Come on, what's something more 2022? Well, you text this number, 970. There's nothing more 2022 than texting. 970-279-3432. Or use the QR code. You enter your information, say, I was a guest here, I was a visitor here. You enter that information, we'll send you a gift. You say, I'm not a guest here, I just, I want to, I have a prayer request. I need to make a decision for Jesus. I've been in the friend zone with Jesus for 60 years. And today, he's walking by asking me to go deeper and to give up all that I am certain about to accept his uncertainty, which will mean the greatest certainty. He's tapping me on the shoulder. You just, just say so in the text. Say so in the, on, the, on the connect card. You want to make a decision? In first service, we celebrated a baptism. And, and a profession of faith. One who had been baptized but said, I want to join the Campion Church. Never been a member of this church in my life. Maybe today is that day for your decision. Beloved, do it. Don't walk away with your head hung down like the young ruler. Please don't. But return like Elisha did and say, family, get together. We're having a party. I'm going all in for Jesus. Amen. And amen. May it be, if it's been 60 years, if it's been 20 years, if it's been two years, that the day you would hear the voice of the master calling you, for deeper, more intimate than you've ever imagined. It's the greatest uncertainty in the world. And with certainty, we'll have eternity to talk about it.
Again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Until again we meet in worship. Amen.